the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A feather-brained fellow forced his father to fork over his farthings. Fast he flew to foreign fields and frittered his family's fortune, feasting fabulously with floozies and faithless friends. Flooded with flattery, he financed a full-fledged fling of funny foam and fast food. Fleeced by his fellows in folly, Facing famine and feeling faintly fuzzy, he found himself a feed flinger in a filthy foreign farmyard. Feeling frail and faintly, fairly famished, he fain would have filled his frame with foraged food from the fodder fragments. Fooey, he figured. My father's flunkies fare far fancier, the frazzled fugitive fumed feverishly, facing the facts. Finally, frustrated from failure and filled with foreboding, but following his feelings, he fled from the filthy foreign farmyard. Far away, the father focused on the fretful, familiar form in the field and flew to him and fondly flung his forearms around the fatigued fugitive. Falling at his father's feet, the fugitive floundered forlornly. Father, I have flunked and fruitlessly forfeited family favor. Finally, the faithful father, forbidding and forestalling further flinching, frantically flagged the flunkies to fetch forth the finest fatling and fix a feast. Faithfully, the father's firstborn was in a fertile field fixing fences, while the father and the fugitive were feeling festive. The foreman felt fantastic as he flashed the fortunate news of a familiar family face that had forsaken fatal foolishness. Forty-four feet from the farmhouse, the firstborn found a farmhand fixing a fatling. Frowning and finding fault, he found father and fumed floozies and foam from frittered family funds, and you fix a feast following the fugitive's falderall? The firstborn felt it was fitting to feel favored for his faithfulness and fidelity to family, father, and farm. In foolhardy fashion, he faulted the father for failing to furnish a fatling and feast for his friends. His folly was not in feeling fit for feast and fatling for friends. Rather, his flaw was in his feeling about the fairness of the festival for the found fugitive. His fundamental fallacy was a fixation on favoritism, not forgiveness. Any focus on feeling favored will fester with friction. Any focus on feeling favored will fester and friction will force the frayed facade to fall. Frankly, the father felt the frigid's firstborn frugality of forgiveness was formidable and frightening. But the father's former faithful fortitude and fearless forbearance to forgive for fugitive and firstborn flourishes. The far-sighted father figured such fidelity is fine, but what forbids fervent festivity for the fugitive that is found? Unfurl the flags and finery. Let fun and frolic freely flow. Former failure is forgotten. Folly is forsaken. Forgiveness forms the foundation for future fortune. These four facets of the Father's fathomless, foundless for fugitives are forgiveness, forever faithful friendship, fadeless love, 
and a facility for forgetting flaws. A familiar story with a fun and different twist entitled The Prodigal Son and the Key of F and originally written by John Garlick and Gwen Jones in the 1940s. We know how this parable has been allegorized. The fugitive represents the sinners, the firstborn, the righteous, and the father is God. Yet if we look closely at this story, we see that in reality, the father lost both sons, one to a foreign country, the other to self-righteousness. Like a rebellious teenager, the younger son took off for a distant country, far away from the restraints and obligations of the family, where he squandered his wealth in wild living. Some would say that by asking for his inheritance, he was essentially telling his father, you are as good as dead to me. You're worth more to me dead than alive. Yet finally, he came to his senses, not because of someone's argument or ethical exhortation, but out of sheer desperation and hunger. At the end of his rope, he resolved to return home and throw himself humbly upon his father's mercy. Now his older brother was equally as far away from home and family without ever leaving the family farm. He devoted himself dutifully to his father's service, never disobeying a command of his father, and thought no doubt that he was the model of unselfishness. Yet he himself was the center of his every thought so that he was incapable of entering sympathetically into his father's joys and sorrows. He did all the right things, but for the wrong reason. He was wasting his father's love as much as his brother was wasting his father's money because his heart was so hard and calculating. And as a result, he refused to join in the music and dancing because of his envy of a brother who had broken from the family and returned while he remained loyally at home. He failed to realize what his brother had come to learn, that he too was encompassed in the father's love. In reality, there are three prodigals in this story. The word prodigal literally means extravagant, wasteful, spendthrift, and that can apply to all three of them. First, there was the younger son running through his inheritance as though it were water and ending up in the depression that always follows the abuse of freedom. Second, there is the older brother performing his tasks dutifully, though perhaps lovelessly, and squandering months or even years of opportunity to get to know the real meaning of home and sonship. And then there is the father himself, Look what he does when the prodigal returns home. He runs to greet him. No father in Jesus' day would do such an undignified thing, especially to a son who had treated him so poorly. And then when the older son won't come, won't come to him, he goes out to him. Again, very uncharacteristic of a father to whom was owed undying honor and respect. But the father does these things, and so does God for us. Yet, 
To simplify this parable into an allegory is to rob it of its true power. We have only to look at the first three verses to put this parable in context. I mean, they tacked them on there for a reason, didn't they? Look at those opening verses. The Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling at Jesus because he, welcome, he is welcoming and eating with known sinners. To their way of thinking, unconditional forgiveness appears to be condoning the sinful behavior. But what we really see here is that God is always eager to receive those who have wandered away. God's mercy goes beyond our human concepts of how God should act towards sinners. This parable reveals to us the true nature of God, who is like the loving and welcoming father who runs to greet his wayward children with loving arms and acceptance. Yet over the years, somehow God has come to be seen as small and narrow, harsh, judgmental, and mean. And that's the nature of God that is very often portrayed to other people. Well, who would want to come home to a God like that? That's not the God that Jesus portrayed, and it's not the depiction of God that we are to portray either. This is a story about God's extravagant and unconditional love freely offered to all. So where do we fit into all this? How often do we, like the older selves, cut ourselves off from the Father's love? Whether in selfishness or righteous indignation or in pain and questioning, how often do we cut ourselves off from the love of God? And yet, what this story tells us is that the Father is always there, watching for us, waiting for us, ready to throw his arms around us in love before we can even get a word out. This story is about God's unconditional and extravagant love offered freely for both sons. And it is given to them, and if it's given to them, then the Father's love is there for us, too. All we have to do is to believe it and accept it. And perhaps that's the hardest thing to do of all. And once we do believe it and accept it, we are called to share it we are called to share the good news of God's wonderful love to all we know, to share the message that God does love us exactly as we are, so we don't need to try to turn ourselves into someone else. Instead, we just need to be the best me that I can be. This is the message that we are called to share and live out in the community, shining forth God's love to those we meet and acting as if, to borrow St. Paul's phrase from our New Testament lesson, we are truly ambassadors for Christ. Think about that. Now, what does an ambassador do? An ambassador tells people things. An ambassador represents their country or a specific activity. And we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to tell people all about God's costly, abundant, never-ending love for them. Over the last few Sundays, we have heard of God wanting to act like a mother bird who gathers her children under her wings. As a nurturing gardener looking for the fruit of repentance. 
as a loving parent who races to meet his wandering children when they return home. We are called to be ambassadors of that God, inviting people into a relationship with the God who loves them, who loves them like a mother bird, a gardener, a waiting parent, waiting to welcome them home. That's what we are, ambassadors for that God, ambassadors of this church, standing with arms outstretched, ready to say, welcome home. Let us pray. Thanksgiving, blessing, and praise be yours, God of the Incarnation. For you care for us and for our prayer as a loving parent cares for a child. May our love for you and our likeness to you be strengthened every time we pray. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.